sure. grab them. Yeah. Oh, I guess yeah, I, I was kind of drawn to the um, the comments on the side there, you know, regarding audience. Okay. Like let's paragraph, see. let's see, where's the first one for audience? Christina's talking about the multi-directional. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess I dropped some comments on, I think the, the, the comments are really all about this idea of, like there's Christina's comment here, paragraph 25, sentence six. I kind of like, yeah, I get that too. Um, but I think the, the medias kind of comment thread was down paragraph 26, where she says, I love this idea of inventing your audience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like as an AP Lang teacher too, like it's definitely like, you know, we've always said like, know your audience or anticipate your audience. And, you know, people pick that up in the comments below too. So I don't know if you have mm -hmm. thoughts on that, but I thought that was probably, that seems to be the most ripe kind of uh, part of this, or that's what, you know, like everybody was talking about. Uh, yeah, so ideally, if you had the reach, you know, the students, their social media reach, their digital platform reach is usually the same people they just ate lunch with. Mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not thinking about, um, I, th I think in, in later in the article, there's a teacher that presents herself as the rhizomatic self. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, and and that's and that's brilliant. They are our students are rooted in their own peer group. Mm. It's not a network necessarily. It's more of a maybe a nodule, mm -hmm. more of a you know, right. Sometimes even sometimes even becomes inflamed and has to be excised. <laughs> but the, you know, the, so this idea of like okay, so if you had the reach, who are you writing this for? And that may even include. Uh, a tribute piece of writing to mm. somebody who is no longer with us in mm. the physical sense. Mm -hmm. okay. are, are you writing this as a, uh, I did a, a multi-genre project uh, around James Castle, uh, the Idaho artist. Uh, he was deaf mute and made most of his illustrations with soot and spit. Wow. Uh, you know, so when you're, when you're writing back to somebody, like my intended audience would be uh, the other people who knew of James Castle's work. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe try to show James himself. Here's what you made and here's what I'm making. Mm -hmm. So that idea of inventing an audience, um, getting that into some kind of comment that the student can make. Uh, yeah. I'm still wrestling with the idea of flattening. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess. And I was also kind of intrigued with this idea. And I'm sure it's in kind of rhetoric, Aristotelian stuff somewhere, but it's like, this idea, I think in Paul Allison's thing, he's, and other people have mentioned it too, but there's this, I think this is suggesting that we ask multimodal composers to consider what they want their audience to do with their product. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like when I mentioned earlier, like know your audience or whatever, I guess that's implied, but, um, you know, the way that it's said in this article here, I guess, um, brought it to light a little bit more for me. Mm -hmm. So when we say know your audience so that we would know what we would want them to do. Right. Uh, so the transactional model. But then, the, you know, the, the goal of rhetoric is also that, that think and feel piece. So if I'm, if I'm writing to an imagined inventive audience, I would want them, the, the, the reader that I'm imagining, the audience that I'm imagining, I would want them to feel blank. Mm -hmm. yeah, so now I don't necessarily have to know them, like I'd be able to like identify them in a crowd, but I, I know, I know the heart, the spirit, the, the soul, the, the persona of the person I'm trying to invent here. Mm -hmm. This, this is a person who would, you know, I've said, so now you're not just uh, talking about a physical or demographic, but, uh, um, the very essence of an audience member, uh, uh, a particular person looking at your work. Mm -hmm. yeah and i think like when i think about because i also teach journalism and that kind of discipline too um you know when you write an opinion piece there's always this thing is like you know what what action do you want your audience mm -hmm. to take and so i feel like that idea has been around um but you know in the social you know in this 
connected world because the audience could be, you know, multiple audiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, I think we both puzzled over context collapse and mm -hmm. flattening of multiple audiences into single contexts is, uh, that one kind of puzzled. So I wonder me. if you could also create the audience who would, uh, would be the long hauler audience versus the person who clicks in and is a little bit more temporal. Mm. You know, when I watch, um, when I watch my own family scroll through TikTok, mm. how, ma how, ma how much content is just swiped away? Mm -hmm. And then you, you engage with one and then this one is you either immediately recognize it for what it's trying to present and you, it's, it, for, for me, it's, just, it's phenomenal to watch somebody like just, uh, I don't even know if you can call it rejection because mm. it's, it's part of the usage, it's mm. part of the model. Mm -hmm. so. so you guys are messing with the uh, now comment and conversation? <laughs> yeah, we were kind of going at the, looking at the comments and talking about the comments in our audience section. Cool, cool. We may have to come back and make a comment. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we we failed. You don't get a grade. Okay. We were not the right yeah. audience for the audience. <laughs> let's go. As long as you're, as long as you're, you're happy. Um, we sh let's let's give this uh, four more minutes. Okay. And then, we'll, and then and come Paul, back. You'll introduce yourself. So. Okay. Yeah, and I guess uh, Paul, I also noticed, um, you know, and, and we see it too, like the idea of trolls. I guess they were always there. But this, uh, you know, they mentioned the word invisible audiences, Boyd and them. Um, and I think that sometimes that's where that comes from, right? Some of those trolls, it's like, oh, I didn't see, I didn't really write for them. Mm -hmm. And now they're, they say things that I, that are unwanted audiences. That's another word they use. You know, and the other thing with audience too, is the idea of um, accessibility and, and, and tactics. Uh, you know, those things we don't often think about when working 1.0 or the analog. But, uh, you know, people are now, when they post a picture, they put the uh, the subscript in there, uh, the, the description. Mm. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what we call that. Uh, so that when people are using it, like uh, right now, the, the big thing is Wordle. And people are posting, you know, just sharing from Wordle out into social media. And somebody who's using assisted technology to read that, it, it's a mess if you've ever listened to what that sounds like. Mm, yeah, right? yeah. So are we are we thinking about that? Are we thinking about uh, you know the access piece and how the folks that we haven't imagined, right? So maybe in that imagining the audience and in inventing the audience, we get closer to um, more intentional inclusivity. Yeah. So who who gets so in your imaginative or inventive audience who's who's not there? Yeah. And it, could that be as important as who you envision? Right. Kind of universal design for audience or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like a handicap ramp for or you know assistive ramp for right. readers. Right. Yeah, I just I just learned that about the Target stores. I read this somewhere that they don't actually have like the little um, ramp in the sidewalk. The whole the whole sidewalk is flat. Mm. It's like a flat model, and that's why those big balls are out there right. to, <laughs> to, to protect folks from uh, uh, being hit along that long passageway. But I, I thought that was an interesting access point. So model your model your digital piece after the Target store. Right. Yeah, that's it's really interesting as a you know a metaphor for readership because if my kids think at all or my any of my students think at all about uh, you know assistive technology, it's definitely more like a sidewalk ramp one place and not mm -hmm. the whole target front. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't want to shortchange you talking tonight. I think that was about our four minutes, so maybe we'll head back Ooh. over. <laughs> really? uh, cool. Uh, are you guys getting this chat notification or um hear this and see if it goes. So you're probably looking at my Kumo space now if that works. Okay. Correctly. 
But if I click over here, do you see a political typology quiz? Yeah. Okay. I'll drop this in the chat. So one of the things that I think is pretty important, especially when I'm working with uh, like my college freshmen, is to really help them understand. You can say you're writing to a general audience, or you could even say you're writing to conservatives. But let's really kind of understand what this means. And so this is one of a few places. Um, all sides and their red and mm. blue dictionary is really helpful for this too. But like learning more kind of about the context and thinking about you know who's what are some of the the issues at, at play here, and then looking at you know some of the statistics and looking at how people are voting, and you can look across different states and stuff like that. So. Okay, you may think that a lot of people are really in favor of building the wall. Well, let's let's take a vote and let's look. And well, then how many people in Michigan are in favor versus mm. how many people in Texas? So mm. even in Texas, only forty-one percent mm. uh, suggest. You know, so at least by this poll, you know, and you've got to you know look at how they did the poll and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, all of that to say that helping. Helping break down ideologies and, and getting students to really think about ideologies, I think, is super important. So there's like this I side with, and I don't know what this looks like in an elementary classroom, believe me. Like it's already hard enough to try to do in a college classroom, but um, I, I would think that it could be pretty important to continue having these kinds of conversations. And then here's like the Pew political typologies. And then I'll try to find that red blue dictionary. Yeah. But really helping them unpack and not just saying, well, someone's for this or against that. Well, yeah, but it's more nuanced than that. <laughs> so so Troy is speaking right to the the framework here. They they suggest negotiating power dynamics and potential conflicts in the imagined and actual audiences, mm -hmm. in addition to the goals they have for a given rhetorical situation. So that, that that dovetails very nicely with the the reading for the week too, or at least the reading that they're considering in this series. So yeah, no, but that's uh yeah, that needs right that that's due consideration. Thanks. And I mean I, I draw some of that from work with like the College Ready Writers program from in the week. Hi guys, do you mind coming over to the large group now and Paul, you'll introduce your project and yourself a little bit. Okay. It's when we say COVID's over, but it's not, but it is, but it's, you know, it's gonna be interesting for sure. How are you both? How are things? Good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So what do you think about all this uh, the, from the audience perspective? I think it's really, when I was reading the article yesterday, I was, or today, or today I was commenting and I read it last night because I thought I am determined to become part of this conversation because I remember a few years ago, and Troy, I don't remember if you were at this one, it was an NWP, and they were just talking about, they were referring to just more of that, more of the rubric. Right? And those are the things that I comment on because what was I was flashing back to was the early work of this that they were just teasing out in one of the when I was doing a writing like four days of writing scoring with them and they were trying on all sorts of scoring guides. And is that the maps work? I think so. I think it was like you know I've been part of so many different things on the fringe. And I thought oh, this looks really familiar. The maps work, and I really looked at this as as that and, and Paul's always just so fascinating with his audience anyway I mean the way that he pushes a window and the way he invites um, students and others to really be part of his process and I think he's very intentional in his audience but I think his audience he doesn't give himself enough credit for a broader audience that he brings right I, I that's one of the things he and I've talked about for a long time like I want him to publish a tabletop book like I'm fascinated he does this whole which relates to what he's doing right here he does this whole thing with picture books and I don't know if you've ever seen him do this where he takes a book and he cuts it apart and then creates this collage of the book hmm. but he only allows himself to he never makes a copy so he has to choose all the illustrations 
from one page to the other, you know, what's on one side, what's on the other side to retell the story or to come up. And it is incredible. And it's a lot of that work. And so when I think about the audience for this, I think it's broader than what he intends. You know, I just, he always pushes my thinking when I was, when I was looking at this. And I think for myself and working with the young teachers that I'm working with right now, and I think about audience and, and what kind of rubric I want to use, they don't have a sense of audience. They're very um, assignment driven right now. We are doing an assignment for school mm -hmm. and we have not addressed audience. So I was fascinated with this and it's why I jumped in and started reading because I'm like, oh my gosh. I need to start with baby steps, you know, actually maybe even put on shoes before we walk. But I think it's so important. And I'm not sure Paul realizes his power of the audience, you know, that's kind of my thinking on it. What you're thinking. I kind of am intrigued. I think the kids are all then doing what are called commonplaces, that that genre of like collecting stuff that, you know, you know, I guess scrapbook is one way to think of it, but I think of it like the commonplace has been around for a long time. And those students, I wonder about, you know, who's the audience for a commonplace? Because I always think of the commonplace as kind of a a thing for me, mm -hmm. you know, but I guess, you know, any, any of those kinds of things I've done, I do realize like someone could come across it and, and, you know, what might they think of that? Uh, and yeah, what do I want them to do about that? I think those are considerations, but definitely not things that I communicate well to my students. I don't think I, I, I'm interested in how his students might do this. Right. What do you think, Troy? I appreciated the way that he was trying those multiple approaches so for instance the blackout poem and the six word story or the haiku and bringing bringing textual knowledge that he has you know as a reader and as a writer to this particular text which by all measures was not designed as a literary text <laughs> mm -hmm. and so bringing that sensibility of someone who's trying to use literary devices and literary techniques to analyze a nonfiction text. That, that was one level I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, the other level, I mean, this sounds almost duh, but I mean, just the, the physicality of it, like it was, it's an actual thing, right? You know, it's not, it's not digital. Uh, it's created out of a, an existing piece of text and then remixed and repurposed and redone and all in physical space, which I think is uh, perhaps a, an interesting experiment to attend to. So mm. anyway, those are the thoughts. Right. And I think there's Come on, a little over bit about this, this we're COVID, good. you know, that physical is more important than digital. I'm hearing that from my staff a lot, you know, trying to try things on that are less digital because they feel like they were in digital space for so long. Let me drag you all into the into the integrated group again. We're gonna okay. have to call this. Okay, everyone's here now. Um, I think we're for time's sake. 